there's no question that your ability to read the river and understand hydrology is directly related to how well you'll be able to keep yourself safe on the water and perform rescues. The more you understand about the way the rivers work, the more you can work with the water, not against it. As well, there's some hazards that you need to be able to recognize and just stay away from. To begin with, here's some commonly used terminology. Upstream is where the water is coming from. Downstream is where the water is flowing to. River right and river left refer to the right and left from the perspective of looking downstream. As we look downstream here, this is the right and this is the left. Even if we spin around and look upstream, we still refer to the right and left as if we're looking downstream. This is helpful so that when we're communicating, we could say things like, do you see the wave to the right of the rock? And we're all talking about the same wave. We'll be adding in more terminology as we go, but now let's look at how rivers work. One characteristic you need to understand about moving water is that it's extremely powerful. As water flows downhill and gets squeezed into channels, its power is immense. A one meter by one meter by one meter cube of water weighs a thousand kilograms, which is over a ton. You can imagine how many cubes like that, and so how many tons of water are flowing through this channel every second, and how as the water speeds up, the force becomes exponentially greater. The river is so powerful, if you try to fight against it, you'll always lose. But if you work with the water, you can use its power to your advantage. Luckily, a second characteristic that's good to know about is that whitewater is actually very predictable. When you first look at rapids, they look like a chaotic mess of whitewater. However, water follows the rules of physics, so as long as you understand some basic rules, we can learn to read water and we can often predict which direction the water will push on people, boats, and riverbanks, and other objects. The first rule of physics that the water wants to follow is that it flows in a straight line. In a straight channel, the water flows parallel with the riverbanks. But on a river with bends, the flow of the water doesn't mimic the bends in the river. Instead, streams of water flow in a straight line until they hit against a riverbank and bounce off at an equal and opposite angle. Think of it like a billiard ball hitting against the side of a pool table and bouncing off in the opposite direction. Here, the river hits against a wall and bounces off, and that's why the fastest current's usually on the outside of a bend. It's also why if you're trying to figure out the direction of the current, which could be really important when you're trying to figure out what angle to set up a rope or what angle to place your boat or your body, you don't think about the direction of the current as being parallel with the riverbanks. Instead, you should both look at the water to see which way it's flowing, but also look at the obstacles and riverbanks upstream to figure out how it's been deflected. Water flowing in a straight line is called laminar flow. In laminar flow, we can predict which direction a boat or person will be carried, but one important thing to note is that the speed of the current within the laminar flow is different depending on the depth and the distance from the riverbanks. The current is slowed down by friction with the river bottom and the banks, so the slowest current is usually right along the river bottom and up against the shore. The surface of the river is also slowed down a bit by friction with the air. So water at the surface is usually moving slightly slower than the water just below the surface. If you can imagine a smooth, concrete, rounded channel, the fastest water would be out in the middle of the river and a little bit below the surface. This is really important to understand if we're trying to figure out how fast something will move downstream. It depends how much it floats. We refer to things that float at different levels as different types of loads. We could classify them as surface loads, suspended loads, and bottom loads. An example of a surface load would be an upright boat, like a raft. A suspended load would be a person wearing a PFD. Even though their head might be above the surface, most of their body is suspended below the surface. And a bottom load could be a waterlogged log or perhaps a rock or maybe a person not wearing flotation. Knowing what we just talked about, about current speeds, we can predict that the fastest loads are suspended loads, the second fastest loads are surface loads, and the slowest loads are bottom loads. This is helpful to understand why somebody who falls out of a boat is often really hard to catch up to, even if you might be paddling towards them if they're in strong current. It also explains why if you're searching for a person on a rescue or recovery and the person 
wasn't wearing a life jacket or their life jacket slipped off, which is actually very common with unconscious people, that they may have sunk to the bottom and you could often find them very close to the point last seen. Even in a fast flowing river, especially if there are some deeper pockets where the water at the bottom may be moving very slowly or not at all, again, subjects are often found very close to the point last seen where they went below the surface. So to review, in laminar flow, the current flows in a straight line and surface loads, suspended loads, and bottom loads move along with the current at different speeds. But another rule of physics is introduced by bends in the river and obstacles, and this is that the water wants to find its own level. If you take a scoop of water out of a tub, it levels off right away. Well, kind of in the same way, if water hits, hits an obstacle like a rock and bounces off at an equal and opposite angle, it's not just going to leave an empty space behind that rock. Water's going to flow back in to fill that area. We call this area an eddy. In an eddy, the water flows back upstream or is still. Eddies are found throughout rivers, downstream of rocks, and on the insides of bends. Eddies are a super important feature rec to recognize because we use them to stop on our way down a river or as a landing zone when we're transporting somebody on a rescue. In between the eddy, where the current is flowing upstream, and the downstream current, we find eddy lines. The upstream and downstream currents flowing against each other side by side create another type of current that's called helical flow. Helical flow moves up and down like a spring or a helix. This creates whirlpools that bring the water down and boils that bring the water up. Boils and whirlpools make for some funny moving water. Eddy lines are actually shaped more like a wedge. They're narrow at the top of the eddy and widen out at the bottom. Knowing this, the best place to cross an eddy line, whether you're swimming or in a boat, is usually near the top. So you can get across this funny water as fast as possible. When you cross the wide section on a powerful eddy line, your boat or body will be exposed to the whirlpools and boils, making it harder to get across. And you may be rejected. When boating or swimming into an eddy, you also generally want your boat or body to cross the eddy line at 90 degrees to the eddy line. That gets you across the turbulent water as fast as possible. So generally, to get into an eddy, to review, you're best to cross the eddy line up high and at a right angle to the eddy line.